It looks like we should be good to go. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to How Are We Doing? An Exhibit Conversation. Um, I'm Tim Goldsmith, the Curator and Education Director for the Association for Visual Arts. Um, uh, we are going to be um, talking with three of the artists from the exhibit. Um, uh, how are we doing a pandemic retrospective? Um, from what I can see in the people joining us today, many of you are artists in the exhibit, so I'm glad to see you all here. Welcome. Um, and to all the rest of you joining us, welcome as well. Uh, I am joined tonight by um, Sam Lestar, who is a AVA member artist uh, working in new media and digital work. Um, Kelly Spell, who is also an AVA member artist uh, and a modern quilter and uh, textile artist. And I'm also joined by Shyella Rowe, who is the um, arts, uh, make sure I get this straight, the Arts Therapies and Wellbeing Program Coordinator at CHI Memorial Hospital, um, as well as a mosaic artist here in town. Um, if I could get each of you to just um, briefly introduce yourselves, um, talk a little bit. I have images of your work in the exhibit, um, so I can go through and um, have that as a reference behind you. So if you could just give a little background about yourself and um, a little introduction to the work. And Shyla, let's start with you. Thanks, Tim. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Shyla Rowe. As Tim said, I work at CHI Memorial Hospital. My background is actually in creative arts therapies. Um, over 20 years ago, I trained with a master's in counseling and expressive arts therapies at Lesley University. And, um, and I uh, learned how to use art and music and dance and drama and poetry, all of those modalities within a therapeutic counseling practice. And uh, in one of my first internships, I worked at a psychiatric hospital in Bournewood um, called Bournewood Hospital in Brookline, Massachusetts. And one of the art therapists that worked at that clinic would often use mosaic arts to um, uh, work with the patients there. And that's how I learned. And I did it really just as self-care uh, at that time, going through grad school and um, continued my practice in a lot of different ways over the last 20 years. But um, I'm also a registered drama therapist and a lot of the work that I'm doing at Memorial Hospital is um, really geared towards community engagement, um, social justice and, uh, and health equity, uh, largely using the creative arts as that sort of platform and that language to engage with the community on those topics. I could go on and on, but I'll stop now. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Kelly, let's go with you next. Yeah, hi, I'm Kelly Spell. I am a modern quilter. I live in Hickson, Tennessee, here just outside of Chattanooga. And I have been making quilts since 2014. So what is that, eight years now? Um, mostly focused on abstract uh, designs, lots of bright, bold colors, unlike the quilt that you see here and the quilt that is featured in the exhibit. Um, I should say, since I'm sitting in front of a quilt that has bright, bold colors, this is not my work. Uh, this quilt was made by a quilter in the Philippines, but um, yeah, that is generally what I'm attracted to and have been doing for a long time. I exhibit a lot of my work at AVA and have exhibited work in galleries and museums across the United States, as well as a variety of quilt shows all around the world. Great, thanks, Kelly. Um, and Sam? Hi, I'm Sam Lestar. I'm a digital artist and um, I create digital art just like you would create a painting, but instead of paint, I use pixels. So 
for me, I'm kind of wholly new to the scene. I only started digital art about two years ago, and I've only been working with the arts community in Chattanooga for about a year. So I'm still um, sort of learning about everything and, and really delightfully enamored with how wonderfully inclusive and um, just fun and interesting the Chattanooga scene is. As far as like my own work, I tend to deal with a lot of figurative work. Um, where I use symbolism in order to create meaningful discourse for um, mental health. I've had a lot of struggles throughout my life. And one of the ways that I deal with that is art. And it's also one of the ways that I help connect myself to other people. Because um, for me, we connect through stories. And so each one of my pieces and this one behind me and that one up there as well is also mine um, are about at the end of it connection. Um, this piece is sort of different because this is what happens when a connection can't be something that you want it to be. And so this is the anger I feel at, um, you know, the struggle I'm having with having people see health from my perspective as someone who's um, vulnerable. I've had very bad asthma my whole life and a couple other health problems. And so for me, the pandemic hit very differently than it might have hit someone who is very healthy. And this was kind of my, you know, I want you to see yourself the way that I see you when you're not willing to take care of basic things for me, because I've always had a mentality of we're in this together. And in some ways, I think we did that well in the pandemic. In some ways, I think we really fell short. Um, and so this piece is definitely very inflammatory in the sense that it's, it's aggressive, but I think anger can be used positively it can be used to symbolize something that needs to be addressed. It can be used to symbolize something that is hurting. And so for me, this piece is about anger, but it's more importantly about the fact that I felt discarded. And I know that other people who mean a lot to me felt the same way, who have complex medical needs. And, you know, so that's kind of what this piece is about. There's a lot more to it, but I tend to let people choose the other parts for themselves because that's more important than the discourse that I can lay on it. Um, great, thank you. Um, uh, if you're just joining us, uh, we just did introductions. Uh, we um, are gonna spend a little time unpacking kind of the exhibit itself. Um, and then I will kind of go back to these works and unpack them individually a little bit more. Um, and then I'll have um, just some questions about themes, um, kind of the purpose um, and, and use of art in times of trouble and times of unrest, um, in times of difficulty. Um, so we'll unpack some of those themes a little bit. Um, and at the end of this discussion, there will be a time for question and answer. So if any of you who are joining us have questions for any of our panelists or artists, um, or even for me, um, there'll be a time at the end uh, to have that conversation as well. Um, I'm going to go to the next slide, which is just an image of the main gallery at AVA. Um, uh, as we talk through individual works. Um, there will also be slides that have images from the exhibit both at AVA and at CHI Memorial. Um, uh, Shyla, I'm gonna pose this question to you. If you could just, um, and I'll also kind of bounce off of it a little bit. Um, Shyla was Ava, our collaborator in this exhibit and also our co-host at CHI Memorial. Um, and Shaila, if you could talk just a little bit about how this exhibit um, came together. Um. Well, I'll tell you, um, for me, the spark hit uh, January of last year. I was helping with our first vaccine fair for all of the employees at CHI Memorial and, um, and then had <clears throat> an opportunity for my own uh, vaccine to, to get the first dose of the Pfizer vaccine. 
And I think at that time, um, there was just so much ang anxiety and fear um, and hopelessness that we felt like that, that, uh, that opportunity for the vaccine to help us see a light at the end of the tunnel meant so much here in the hospital in particular for our doctors and nurses and especially our ICU staff that were working on the front lines with um, so many patients who didn't make it. And so uh, at the end of that vaccine fair, one of our nurse directors came up to me and she put an empty vial in my hand. And she said, here you go, this is yours to, uh, to keep as a memory of this time. And I, I, look, I sat and cried. I mean, I, I held that tiny little, I mean, you know, when you're getting the shot, you don't really notice all the materials, but then holding that little vial in my hand, oh my gosh, like I just, it was this tiny little thing that had such a big, powerful impact. And, um, and my first thought was, oh my gosh, we have to make art out of this. <laughs> so I think for me, that's where it started was just thinking um, there are materials and things that, I mean, just today I threw away like one of those little plastic baskets that you can put inside a mask to hold it away from your face. That was like a trendy thing. Circa 2020, when we started wearing masks and we're like, oh God, I hate this thing touching me. And I just want to pull it away a little bit. And they didn't work well, they were terrible. So I threw mine away, but you know, it's like all of that ephemera that we wanted to get rid of so much, but now it's like, oh wait, you know, this might 10, 15, 20 years from now, it'll mean so much. So yeah, that's that's where it started for me. Um, and I, I just wanted to see what other people were making. Like I knew that people were feeling things and experiencing emotions and, and developing stories and narratives. And I just was desperate to see our community show their work from this time. Um, and I'll jump into that too. Um, there, um, there's an artist uh, here in town uh, who um, both Shyella and I know pretty well, uh, named Kate Kelly, who also has work in the exhibit, um, who uh, approached me with this idea um, for doing um, a work of art with vaccine vials. Um, there was just something that she had in her head that was like, these are amazing little objects and we've been waiting so long for this even though it's been a year and here's this thing um and although it did not um at the time she had an idea for a work which she wasn't able to to put together in time um there was this kind of like you Shayla, there was this kind of spark of oh somebody has an idea, somebody's processing this experience that we're all going through. Um, and for me as a curator and who, who is now working with a lot of artists in, in the city and in the region, um, that, and then in conversations with you, that got me thinking that there are people who are working on things. Um, there are people who are processing this pandemic. There are people who, and whatever that means, whether that is they're locked up at home in quarantine and baking sourdough bread or learning how to do a new creative process. Um, or if you're like me, um, who was actually, I was actually like in the hospital a year and a half ago with COVID and kind of processing that experience of um, recovering from that. Uh, people who have lost loved ones, people who are dealing with long-term symptoms, um, there are people who, on the other end as well, um, the other side of the spectrum, people who don't think of this experience as a big deal, who kind of, um, you know, the political discourse around it, and also the adjacent conversations and um, things that have been happening in society too. I think of um, kind of um, racial violence and um, the murder of George Floyd. There's a couple pieces in the exhibit about and in response uh, to, to racism and kind of that conversation that's happening um, parallel and adjacent to the pandemic um, and intertwined. Um, and so it was important and it felt important and it felt timely um, to, to seek to create a space for that work. Um, and when we put out the call, we weren't entirely sure 
um, how people would respond to it. Um, and then and we got 80 submissions from 30 artists um, in, in the region um, and a whole, whole range of, of works. Um, uh, so again, thank you. Those of you who are joining us tonight who are uh, artists in the exhibit, thank you so much for submitting um, and for sharing your work um, to Chattanooga um, and to, to the associates and patients at Memorial Hospital um, as well. Um, pivot, let's pivot a little bit. Um, and I open this question to the three of you. Um, uh, and Sam, you've mentioned, you started, you kind of um, got a little at kind of your own experiences of, um, of dealing uh, with uh, being someone who has kind of um, vulnerability um, in the larger kind of society. Um, if the three of you could, um, just one at a time, maybe um, talk a little bit about some of the experiences that you feel comfortable sharing that kind of led to the work that you submitted um, um, and, and why it was important to translate that to a creative process. Who wants to start? I can start if nobody wants to start. Um, Shia was talking about um, January of 2021 and how it felt very dark at that time. And I know a lot of folks in the hospital had this light at the end of the tunnel that was a little closer for them than it was for the rest of us. And when I was making the quilt that you see in the photo, um, I started that on November 4th of 2020, the day after the presidential election. And everything felt very dark at that point. I think even with all of the news about these miraculous vaccines and how quickly they were being developed, it just felt so far away for me, um, someone who is lucky to not be in the vulnerable communities who really needed this first. Um, so that timeline just felt so drawn out and it just felt like there wasn't a lot of hope around and everything felt just hard and complicated and the president of the United States at the time was not making it any easier. <laughs> and so I was just trying to channel um, those feelings. It's funny when I look back at 2020 um, in the quilting community, there's been a lot of conversation about, you know, when March, middle of March came around, like some folks immediately shut down, people stopped making work. Um, some folks were like, this is the free time that I needed to really dive into a project. And so there's sort of a split and I'm sure there are lots of people in the middle ground too, but like people who were like, I feel complete void of creative motivation right now. And people who are like, I'm gonna, I have things that I need to get out and like work on. And I certainly fell into the first category. Like I was not feeling creative. I was not feeling inspired. I was not feeling motivated in any way. And I think, during that whole year, I think I finished two quilts, if I can remember correctly, and they were both pandemic related. The first one was not so dark, but I can really see the dark frame of mind that I was in at the time, you know, gravitating towards black and white and gray fabrics, um, using those to make a pretty somber and solemn piece that you know, even though I personally have been very lucky and have not experienced any major loss or death in my family or close circle of friends, I know that there are people who have and who are, and I wanted to express my connection to them, my solidarity with them. And so it was important to me to, to express that in a way, um, while also working out the, the anger and depression and all the difficult feelings. Kind of leave it there for now but that's kind of, that's my my starting point sam i don't want to jump ahead of you but i just want to talk a minute about art making and anger and depression and um difficult controversial subject matter that comes into art making um i want to acknowledge that for 
a lot of visual artists who are in it because this is your profession, this is your livelihood, this is how you generate income for yourself, um, that it's not all about self-expression and emotions and feeling. Um, I had a, When I was in grad school 20 years ago, I had an artist friend of mine say to me, um, Shaila, I'm, I'm not processing my feelings when I make art, this is my job. <laughs> And, and I, I checked that. I was like, okay, I get it. But there are times when we, as creative beings, use this platform, this language, this material as a way to kind of draw out what's going on on that sort of biological, um, psychological, you know, neurological, whatever it is that, that may be stressing us out or overwhelming us or making us sad. And we pull it out and we play with it in a way. Like that is part of the process here is, we, you know, that was part of the prompt is we are asking people to engage with some difficult things, right? We didn't say, hey guys, let's talk about your favorite beach trip. <laughs> you know, in your history and, and play it easy and safe, right? No, we said, how you doing? <laughs> you know, knowing the answer is there's been a lot of suffering here and there's been a lot of fighting and anger and frustration. And, um, and we intentionally are asking our community to engage with that difficulty, with that hard stuff. We are asking ourselves to look at things that we might find offensive and, and sit with that for a minute and try to develop some empathy with other people. So thank you for bringing that up because I think that's such an important foundation to this conversation here. Are we good? <laughs> yeah, go, go Sam. <laughs> For me, the experience has been overwhelming. I'm still in quarantine. I have been in quarantine since the beginning of this with very limited outings when I felt like things were doing better when we had full vaccines and when you know the hospitals were down, I could go back out. Now I'm stuck inside again and have been since basically making that piece. I think I made that piece the week that I went back in and I had just, I had just started foraying back into the grocery stores. I had just started, you know, going out and um, seeing friends at a distance even. Um, it's been a really long time. It's, you know, I can't do the things that I used to do. I can't be the person that I was before this. And if I tell someone the way I feel, then they get caught up in the words. But if I can explain to them the way I feel through my paintings, and I've pretty much made all of my pieces in the pandemic. I started making digital work right around the time that this started. And so my entire collection is about connection. And I think because very much so I am missing that as a person who got left behind in a medical community that doesn't understand, um, you know, and there has been like, you know, we'll see it online where they're like, well, if people are sick, they should just stay home. That's really nice. I dare you to do it for as long as I have. I dare you to do it for as long as my medically fragile friend and um, their special needs uh, brother that they care for. They have been in, they have not gone out, period. Um, you know, it's a different thing when you're experiencing it. And so for me, you know, I've, I've had the lovely, Ava has been wonderful about making it accessible as possible for me. And I have gotten to do a few things with them, but um, you know, I went through all of those highs and lows and I processed all of that in isolation, essentially. Um, you know, I'm with my spouse, but that's one person, that's a lot to put on one human being. Um, and I wanted to talk to people about apathy. Apathy, it doesn't feel sinister until you're on the other end of it. And what I experienced was some people truly understanding and the ones who did, I appreciate you, I need you, and we need you. 
but the ones who didn't, I want you, I want to talk to you about apathy. I want to talk to you about not seeing from my perspective because it is painful. It, and, you know, in a lot of my work, I talk about pain. I talk about trauma. And I think even though I have my own set of trauma, I can realize at a higher level, we have all experienced trauma from this. Even the people who took it the least amount seriously, you may have lost someone. I um, am not close to my biological family, but we had someone pass away due to COVID. And none of my family would acknowledge that that was what happened. Um, you know, the apathy, it, it, it is extensious. It, it will, it is so deeply woven into the political discourse, into the Black Lives Matter discourse. Um, uh, I have a strange family now because I was not apathetic to that and they were. And, you know, I think we have to think about why we're apathetic to things. Um, and this piece really was about that. It was about, don't lay me into apathy. I want you to see how ugly your apathy is. And it's modern because in the old, you know, we didn't have so much, and in some ways I understand the apathy because there's so much information, right? It's modern. We have access to an insane amount of information an insane amount of bad news. And so we are apathetic to that bad news because it's overwhelming. And if you need time to process that, I give you space for that but please don't forget that it eventually does have to be processed. Um, whether that is for you or that is for the people around you or is that is for what you lost because we all lost something. We lost people, we lost connections, we lost opportunities, we lost so much, but we gained something too. And I don't wanna lose that because this is an image of a burning forest in the background. And if you know anything about burning forest, one of the things that happens after a forest burns is there is fertile ground. There is hope. There is, when you open Pandora's box and everything comes out there at the end, there was hope. And so for me, as I, I love storytelling, it's the way that I connect to the world and the way that I see the world and the way that I make it make sense for me. And so I don't want it to just be anger because it is, it's fiery, it's painful, it's destructive, but it's also creative and in, it, it, is a home for growth. And so the thing when you know something negative is you have a place for growth. This is a forest fire and we've let it burn too long. We are not taking the initiatives we need to take. I mean, some of us are, and I appreciate the ones who are. Get your vaccinations, please wear a mask because if everyone in the grocery store wear a mask, I could get salad. Do you know how long I have been without fresh vegetables and how I've been without things that people take for granted? Because people won't wear their mask. People won't get vaccinated. People won't do the most basic of things because they see it as something that only affects them. And when your opinion only affects you, it's fine to have that opinion, but you need to think about who your opinion affects. That's very well said. Tim, I don't know if you have another I'm just question. I'm so sorry. He's, he's very well. No. Well, you were talking about, um, you know, people need to process things. And I think one of the reasons I wanted to make this quilt, there have been so many articles written about grief and how we all experience grief differently and how Americans tend to be really bad at grieving in general, but like grieving on an individual level and also grieving on a community level and on a societal level. And so like, how do you, how do you even try to express that? And so I think when I woke up on November 4th and just felt this rage, um, one of the first things that came to mind was a, an antique graveyard quilt. And Tim, I sent some pictures of this to you. There's a this is widely known as just the graveyard quilt. Um, it was started in the 1840s by a woman named Elizabeth Roseberry Mitchell. Um, she and her daughters, Sarah and Elizabeth, worked on this over their lifetimes, but they made this quilt. Um, graveyard quilts were not 
uncommon during this time, but there are coffins around the edge. So on the left side of your screen is kind of the overall photo of the quilt. And down in the center, you'll see an image of the edge of the quilt. There's a fence line and some coffins. You'll see a space where there's a, a blank space where there used to be a coffin. And then on the right hand side of the screen are is a close up of the, the graveyard section of the quilt. So sort of near the center of the quilt, there are some coffins that are, are in the graveyard. And uh, this family made this quilt while most of their family members were still alive and the coffins at the around the edges each had a family member's name on them written on paper. And then as people died, they would take those, they would unstitch the coffins from the edge of the quilt and move them into the cemetery and write the date of their death on it and stitch it back down. And so just that process of grief, like what are the processes that we go through? What are the stages of grief? How do we move through it through those as individuals? And how do we move through those as families and communities? Like just exploring that idea was interesting to me. Um, my quilt is more of a modern interpretation. There's not nearly as much handwork on it. Um, I thought about applicating people's names onto the coffins, but that just at the time felt, this was already very heavy and it just felt like a level of uncomfort, discomfort that I was not willing to go to. So I thought, had thought like, well, maybe I'll applique names, you know, embroider the names in red uh, thread on the coffins or something like that. But it, like I said earlier, I don't have any personal connections, personal family, friends, deaths that I experienced yet to COVID. Um, so it was like, well, what names would I put on there and what meaning would it have? And Honestly, I think just having them be anonymous is meaning enough. Like we can still connect and grieve the loss uh, felt in our community, even if we don't know their names. Um, and so I wanted, uh, this is two-sided quilt and you saw it in the gallery and I wanted people to sort of experience the front side, which is the coffins and, and go through a set of emotions experiencing that side and then maybe come around to it after having seen other things in the gallery and then be sort of hit with this gut punch in the back, which is sort of how it felt at the time of like, we're all grieving, but we're all angry at the same time. And just how do you hold those emotions together um, and experience those together was a, an interesting exploration in this piece. I like that you left it open named because it's such a volume of people that we lost if you really think about it it's new. yeah yeah there's only like a hundred and something odd coffins I can't remember I did the math at some point we could do it I think it's like 12 by 7 or something um it's not very many people represented if you think about it um I think during the two months it took me to make this more than 77,000 people in the United States died just in that two month time period. And so just the volume of that was overwhelming. And essentially what you did by making it two-sided and, and the way this was presented in the gallery was really interesting because you have to walk into the gallery, look at it and then walk around it. So you have, you have to, to confront it, right? Yeah. yeah. You have to, and also what you've done is you, and essentially you've veiled your anger, which is something as people we do we veil our anger because it's not, uh, you know, it's not something that leads a good conversation. People tend to balk at anger. They tend to back up. And so essentially you created this discourse and then you punctuated it, which I think I've seen in your work before. Uh, I just really think it's, it's really interesting and it's a really organic way of having a conversation through fabric. Yeah. Thank you, Sam. I like that. I like that thought about it. This actually is a, this kind of, Kelly, the, 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 the thing about your piece in the gallery and my desk sits perpendicular to it. Um, so I get to hear and I get to witness all of the interaction that people have as they come into the gallery. Um, and it's really interesting. And I'm actually, I'm, I'm talking about the quilt specifically, but I, I'm also gonna use this as a tra transition to an, another kind of question. Um, one of the interesting things is that there, there's different interactions that happen. There's the, the person that sees it in the window 
and is just like really curious about what it is and they come they literally like a like a moth to a flame goes straight to it and just stand in front of it um and are not really aware of kind of like what's around them um and then they'll kind of like oh yeah i'm in a gallery and there's artwork around and i should probably kind of look around um and from there and there is actually like a pattern of movement that happens in the spaces people walk through one one group will go and they'll go immediately to the other side because they know it's hanging up in the air and they want to see like what's going on on the other side um half of those people go oh and the other half go what does that mean i get that question probably once a day from people like what does that statement mean um and then other people will kind of go, they'll see the quilt and then they'll look to their right and there's a large kind of um, colorful, um, somewhat abstracted painting by Olivia Towser that's to the right of it. And people kind of move to that and then they move around and then they go into the back room. Um, and Shyla and Sam's pieces are back there. Um, and there's some really intense uh, images by Joshua Williams back there. And then I kind of, I can hear kind of in the background some mumbling or some talking amongst people. And then they'll come back and then they like, if they didn't see the back of the quilt at first, they see it when they're walking back through and then have this kind of delayed response after they've seen everything else. Um, one of the the things that you kind of have brought up, Kelly, um, and Sam, you actually brought up uh, in a slightly different way is this idea of making space um, of of um, the names are not embroidered. They're just the shapes. They're um, they're uh, kind of fill in the blank for the the audience, the viewer as they come in. Um, and, and Sam, you talked about the you know. Uh, the empathy and the experiences of like these, these are my experiences these are the things that I'm, I'm doing without um, and you're inviting people to kind of respond to that um, one of the one of my hopes as the curator for this exhibit was to create space for people to kind of wrestle through um, and 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 sit and as Shaila you mentioned to just sit with like difficult realities, but to do so in a way that is um, is hospitable, um, that is kind of intermixed. There's there's difficult content, but there's also we have like you can kind of see back here in the background we have Richard Rice's political cartoons from the Wall Street Journal of uh, really really funny, um, just you know somebody at a bar saying this person six feet away wants to buy you a drink you know just this like really kind of funny response to things um and and that all of those have been um the experiences there has been the real anger the real rage the the isolation and loneliness and there's also been humor in really odd ways there's been humor and there has been um kind of generative work that's happened um you know people uh, we have uh an artist who had been a woodworker and um jim cape and then hadn't done anything in a long time and then was just stuck at home and then started making again as just this way to kind of work through it and um uh, it could you all talk a little bit about the idea or kind of respond a little bit to the idea of um making space um uh, and and I, I want you to kind of respond broadly to art in general um how what is the role of art in making space for people for an audience for you um however you want to finish that sentence or that question um and i leave that to to you all to respond to for me, when I create a piece, it's always about the emotional space that I have in it. It's creating a, a, a space for that. Because when I make my work, it's about processing that specific part of what I'm going through. And I, I have PTSD. So um, sometimes I experience and I talk about difficult things in my work 
And what will happen and what I've seen happen is someone will message me or someone will say something to me. I, I see me in your work. And they will tell me their story and I am able to connect to them and they are able to connect to me and we are able to share a painful, but ultimately connective reality. We are able to have that space together. And in that moment, me and this person are existing and we are understanding. And that is why I'm so interested in making art. It is to make that space. It's all about that because I grew up in a, in a, in an environment where there wasn't space for that. And then there was with certain people. And what I found is sometimes when you make art, you create a conversation and that creates space. If someone comes in and says, this is how I feel. And that helps them connect to someone else, or it makes them feel connected to me. Then that has created a room for us. It has created a place for those feelings. And as, as a greater scheme of the artist world, I've walked through galleries and sometimes a piece will stop you. And it could be the smallest piece. It could be the piece that doesn't, and everyone else will walk past it and you'll stop and you'll have a moment. And it's almost like love at first sight. It's, it's understanding at first sight. It's you see me, you've never met me and you see me. I see you and I don't know what your face looks like and I don't need to know because at this moment we have this space, these people walking around and there is this space. There is this moment. That is why for me art exists. The pieces I love the most are not always the most technical, although sometimes they are. The pieces I love are the ones who stop you and make you see human in it. They make you see connection they make you see space and they give you space in your own mind because a lot of times when you've been through trauma you don't process that until later and you need something to help you unlock that you need a moment where oh my god that did happen or how do I do this how do I have this conversation with someone I love because and if art does that and it does do that then it is absolutely worthy of the time and the effort that we put in not only to making these pieces, but learning how to make them, learning how to have those conversations. That's what we're doing as artists. We're room makers. We make room. I don't know how anybody is going to follow that, Shia. <laughs> that was pretty wonderful, Sam. I appreciate your thoughts there. I was thinking I 100% agree with everything that you said and another aspect of making space that I consider is more of a, a selfish aspect of it but my practice is just making mental space for me to process things to just think about the day that you know sewing painting a lot of artistic practices are solitary practices that involves spending a lot of time with yourself. And oftentimes I will do that. I will make quilts. I will sew in silence in my studio. Sometimes I'll be blasting music. Sometimes very rarely I'll listen to a podcast or a book. Um, but most of the time I'm just in the quiet, just with my thoughts, making space for those thoughts, making space for processing things. And sometimes the things I'm processing are related to the work. Uh, to the the piece that I'm working on and sometimes they're not um, and sometimes I notice connections later on that will come up in a thought process or or you know I'll see the way that I was thinking show up manifest itself physically in the object um, even if I wasn't 100% conscious of it and so just making that space as individuals to really be present with our emotions as much as we can be. And I think it's also a way, you know, I tend to do a lot of writing, but I sometimes struggle to, to talk about complicated or difficult subjects verbally. And so having a quilt do the talking, there are lots of quilt makers who have come before me, many who make controversial message quilts, things that are difficult to receive. Um, and they talk about how 
you know, a quilt is soft, it's familiar, people associate it with comfort. And so having a difficult message be delivered in that kind of vehicle makes it maybe a little bit more accessible to someone than it might be if we were having a, a hard face-to-face -face conversation or even a, 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 you know, a typed out conversation on the internet. And so making space for those kinds of things also and using textiles as part of that process is, um, is important for me. So I agree, yes, um, with both Sam and Kelly. And I think what I would like to bring into this conversation is a little bit of uh, my nerdy science brain. Um, I didn't mention earlier, I'm working on a PhD and my dissertation research is on burnout uh, using drama therapy actually with nurses and doctors to help deal with their stress. But part of this conversation that I like to bring in is um, two parts. One of the things is all of this conversation in a way is talking about how we are either humanizing or dehumanizing in in our experiences, right? You know, a lot of what we've described is that sense, that feeling of ourselves or others that we love being dehumanized in some way by the symbols that are created by these sort of big collective experiences, right? The other thing that can happen in our brains is that we, uh, when we're stressed, we tend to kind of gravitate to those short neural pathways where we go from hungry to fed back and forth, or maybe it's like, you know, some, some need that we have pain to pleasure and hitting back and forth on that, on that short neural pathway that um, is very much a part of a trauma experience, right? You kind of get into survival mode and you're going on that. You see it in addiction, you see it in all kinds of things. What art does is it asks us to take the long pathway through all of our big, beautiful lobes of our brain on the way to that pleasure center, right? And in that, what we find is our human self and the human selves of other people. It is, it is a beautiful, wonderful tool for finding the humanity and, and, and stepping away from the, the symbols, the candy, the, you know, the, the quick hit that is uh, rhetoric or, you know, whatever, whatever that, that short answer, that quick hit to our, our uh, pleasure center. So all of that to say, if I haven't bored you to death with that conversation, um, Tim, should I tell the story about the crown? Okay, I wanted to tell the story um, because early on in the pandemic, you can leave both of those up actually, I'll talk about both of those if you have them together. Um, early on in the pandemic, we partnered with a local artist, uh, La Monica Eberhardt from Crowns and Heights to, um, we wanted to celebrate our uh, frontline ICU nurses who were, um, you know, just having a hard time with that grief and loss of so many patients at the very beginning when we didn't have medicines and treatments to really help people um, as much as we have now. And, um, and so we had this event, we invited the nurses to come in, we fed them um, and everybody got a crown made, handmade original crown by La Monica and, um, and she, left a box of charms so the nurses could help each other like add charms onto them and customize them and personalize them. And it was a really sweet, fun moment. Um, and at one point, one of our nurse leaders got called to answer the phone. And, um, you know, it was somebody who was upset about missing their loved one, something that we all understand why the person would be upset. And they lashed out at uh, this nurse leader and she had the crown still on her head. Like she had just run to the unit to answer the call and had the crown still on her head when she was standing there and put her hand 
on the crown while she was on the phone listening to this person just swear up one side down the other, you know, calling her names, upset, angry, lashing out at her. And at the end of the call, she put the phone down and she said, I know I'm not who they said I am. And in that moment, what we recognized, what I recognized was that gesture, that holding on to the crown on her head, in that moment, the art was the thing that made her human, that made her herself, that, that was the reminder, it was that transitional object. And I think it's really important for us to recognize the power of art of multiple forms to be able to help us ground and find ourselves and find others, right? If we allow ourselves to take that long neural pathway from that hunger, that fear, that, that whatever it is to understanding or pleasure or peace or whatever it might be. Um, and I think Joshua Williams' piece really speaks to that a lot too. Uh, and I did have a member of our staff say to me that this piece made them feel sad. And I think they were hoping for artwork that made them feel happy. And that's understandable. And that's really um, part of what we do in the hospital with art is we try to put things that do help people feel peace and, and grounded and okay when they're in the space. Um, but I also think it's important for us to recognize when it's appropriate to mirror another strong emotion um, that helps people to feel seen. And I think for our medical and nursing staff in particular, for anyone who's worked uh, and not had that time of rest, that, you know, pull back time that a lot of us got to have. Um, and so I think Joshua's piece really uh, brings me there. It brings me to a place of mourning and grief and sadness. Um, but also compassion and care. It, it kind of breaks up that dichotomy um, and allows us to feel multiple things at one time. So, did I answer your question, Tim? <laughs> Thanks for letting me tell more stories. Oh yeah, and I'm gonna leave this slide up for a second. We, still, we have some time left. Um, in a few minutes, I'll transition to Q&A for those who have questions. Um, oh, Johanna in the chat is asking if we oh. have an image of Joshua Williams. So his is the one on the left, the embrace. Yes. With the person holding, holding the cup. That one is Joshua Williams, uh, the one that's hanging at Memorial Hospital. So Tim has a few others of Joshua's that are at the Ava Gallery. And I'll I will hold, hold those oh. up as well. Um, I think when we talk about grief, we have this feeling that it's a one-dimensional emotion, mm. and it's so not. I've you know been through you know that whole process myself, and um, it's it's an emotion that is so colorful because there's joy, there's sadness. And I think if we just focus on joy, if we just focus on the positive elements, then we never work with the ones that are less savory, the ones that hurt. But you can't heal a wound by not touching it. And so I think it's important when we talk about the pandemic, we don't just talk about the good things. We do need to talk about them. but we also need to have, again, that space to talk about the painful ones and to talk about how they connect to the good ones, because they do. Grief becomes something that is encompassing. It doesn't latch on to itself. It latches on to everything around it. And I'll, I'll, um, I'll bounce off of that too. Um, and th this is my next question. Um, and I'll, I'm formulating it as I'm like saying it, so bear with me. Um, if, if we only focus on positive things, the beautiful things, the joyful things, the like kind of uplifting, hopeful things, 
Um, one of one of the benefits, um, one of the important aspects of the angry things, the sad things, the depressing things, the uncomfortable things, the um, kind of um, the negative things, if you will, um, is that they stand in contrast to those other things I mentioned. Um, and if you spend all your time in, in the positive, um, sometimes your ability to identify it as such um, can be, you can mischaracterize it or you can start to identify things that are not good um, or not helpful or not healthy um, as good, healthy things. Um, and so doing the work of sitting in difficult things and in discomfort um, and, and, and spending time in those things, um, it hones the skill to be able to determine and to discern the hopeful, the good, the joyful, the beautiful, the like, the positive things. Um, and it's interesting to like, one of the funny things about this exhibit, again, as I sit at my desk and see the people that come in and hear their kind of comments, um, and people talk a lot and don't think that I can hear what they're saying. Um, and I hear a lot of the kind of dialogue that happens in the gallery. In the gallery. Um, and one thing that ends up happening is that people come in and see this show and are usually surprised because some people come in and either they're looking for that thing that's going to just really accentuate their dining room over their table they're looking for um that kind of um you know the thing that's going to go over the mantelpiece that statement piece um they're not coming in expecting to see um an image of a, a giant gun aimed at them with text in it and like blood pouring out of a wound in someone's head and a screaming face um and I've had a lot of comments from people coming in going, oh, that isn't going to look nice in my house. Um, and I think one of the things that this exhibit is highlighting, um, and I'm, I'm glad it's doing, and I'm, I'm, and I'm thankful and grateful for the opportunity to do it and to host this exhibit here and to work with each of you on it, um, is that it makes space to challenge and invites um, and challenges people's perceptions of what art is, what it can be, um, what its purpose is. Um, I think particular, and I will, and this, I think this is also a Southern thing as well. We tend, and, and a Bible Belt thing as well. We tend to associate art as this thing that's supposed to be beautiful. Um, it's supposed to be uplifting. It's supposed to kind of um, emulate something some ideal of something um and what what i have witnessed on a daily basis this collection of work doing is challenging people's perceptions of that um when they leave you know when they leave the walk through the door and go about their business i don't know if it has like made the difference to change that perception for them um, I don't know how long that lingers in their head of what they, you know, what they saw and how it impacted them. And I'm also not the person that is the steward of that, that follows them. That's not my job. Um, but as the curator, it is my job to invite people into that space and to invite them to kind of sit and think and, and spend time with work and spend time looking and to make the work accessible to them to do that. Um, really briefly, um, and then I have, I have a Really quick question I'd like you all to answer. Then I have a sentence I'd like you to finish. And then I will open it up for questions at the end. Um, what do you say to the person who comes into your space? Shyella, Kelly, Sam, who this work makes me sad. Or today what happened, somebody came and saw the quilt and was very angry and left. Um, the person who is angry or the person who's confused and doesn't understand, what do you say to that person who is in that moment of making the, the decision to, to sit, to walk away, the, the, flight or fight, the, the fight or flight response of being confronted with something difficult? What do you say to that person? I would say it makes me mad too. 
that makes me sad too. And I think, I mean, you had a good point. I don't know that I would necessarily want to have one of these pieces on my house on the wall of my house where I was going to see it every day, but making space, like you said, for that part of the conversation is so important. And whenever uh, I hear someone respond to a, a piece that is critical of their way of thinking or is really inviting them to see their point of view in a different light um, and they respond to it negatively. And my reaction is like, well, you can make a piece of art also and express your point of view. You know, there are spaces for that too, for you to voice your opposition or your dissent, uh, your disagreement with the, the things that I have said or that other people have said in my work. And so I think there's space for all of that in this community and the art world. And so I would invite people to sit down and process their feelings and make some of their own work. I'm no stranger to um, uncomfortable feelings. As a non-binary per or you know, non-binary person, A, that's a huge hurdle for a lot of people to get over a queer person I'm neurodivergent I, I have so many things that are already uncomfortable conversations for me uncomfortable conversations are we all know how to drive I know how to have an uncomfortable conversation and I want them to sit with it I want them to understand why the conversation makes them uncomfortable because when something makes you uncomfortable it typically means something it's not just oh that makes me uncomfortable let me leave it it's why you know, I, I am very um, inquisitive. My nature is very much to be like, why? Uh, and, you know, um, the thing is, is, the funny thing is people do not like to be questioned on why they don't like something. Um, you can ask them why they love something and they'll tell you all day. But when you ask them why they don't like something, it's, it's a different conversation. And um, I want them to think about it. I want them to take that moment. And, you know, with my work, especially this piece behind me, um, it's about not wanting to be touched in whatever sense that means. And, you know, I've had people have very strong feelings associated with it. And I want them, if they need to share, then we'll share. If they need to cry, then we'll cry. I'll cry with them. I'll be angry with them. Because an emotion hurts so much more when you have it alone. And so for me, I want my pain to not do that to others. But at the same time, I know that sometimes crying is the best way to say that you're hurt or the best way to say that you're happy or the best way to say that you feel something. And feeling something is the most human thing we can do. I, you know, depression is terrible. It takes away that, it, it takes away the feeling. And so, you know, a lot of these pieces, you can see depression in them, but you can also see strength. You can see movement. You can see deliberate movement toward life. And so when it comes to whether someone doesn't like my work, I, I don't sell a lot. My pieces are not stuff that you put in your bathroom. You don't gift my work to your grandmother. <laughs> you know, it's not, we're not going to put this piece like here's my lovely bathroom piece about how if you touch me I will die <laughs> um, you know and but as an artist is it important to me if I'm selling something that someone finds beautiful now if I stop one person and they have a moment then the 80 hours that went into that is worthy to me because Maybe that person didn't feel seen every day. Maybe that person's having an experience. And if they have a negative, angry experience with me, I can't change that. Their opinion of me and my work is not my business. What is my business is the feelings that I create. If they're angry, they can be angry as long as they don't hurt me. <laughs> um, you know, and figure out why you're angry. Why are you mad? Sometimes I get, we all have puffer fish moments, right? You go, Pff. And for no reason, it can be over something stupid. I have a, a, a sincere issue around like people who pull out in front of people. It's completely unreasonable and over the top. And I know that, and I get very upset when I discuss it. 
but I know that. And if you know you have a puffer fish moment, figure out why. I don't like it because it's dangerous and scary. And that's why I don't like it. It has nothing to do with the other human being. It has to do with my fear of dying in a car accident. <laughs> figure out why something makes you uncomfortable. Process that information. And you don't do it all at once. I'm not saying like sit down in, in a lobby and be like, I'm going to figure out why today eggs make me uncomfortable. Don't do that. But explore it when you have safe space to do so. And that's what I would tell them and be like, if you don't want to explore that here in the middle of this lobby full of people, don't. But don't forget about it. Take it home. Put it on a shelf. And when you have time, look at it. Shala? So Tim, I'm assuming that um, your question is not really literal, like what would I say to the person? <laughs> it's no, no, no. more philosophical. Yeah. And um, and I think my my answer to the question is pretty similar to what Kelly and Sam have said. Um, but in my words, it would be, I I don't know that saying something to someone who has shut down and closed off that encounter um, is ever going to be the way to engage that person. I think the art did the saying. The art engaged that person on purpose and the person responded in the most appropriate way that they knew how, right? And, and I think our desire to want to have some kind of conversation or closure or encounter, it's like what I like to say uh, when I talk about drama therapy and I give people the elevator pitch for that. Are you ever in the shower or driving down the road and you're imagining that encounter and you're just saying exactly what you would really want to say to that person and watching it play out in like the perfect way, right? We want to have the pleasure. That's the short neural pathway. That's that, that's that quick pain pleasure pathway, right? We're wanting that. We want that closure. We want to come up with the right like Twitter response back to that person, right? And, and get all the likes. But the reality is the art did its job and we don't have to say anything. That's the whole point. That's why we did this exhibit because the art needed to say it. We have had two years to put our words out there and watch it float into the ephemera, but we needed the art to say it. And that's, I think my response, but yeah. I 100% agree with you on that. Um, I, te I teach college um, art classes. Uh, I teach at UTC. And one of the things that I try to, um, to encourage my students to think about is they're learning how to make work and how to put it in front of an audience. Um, and this is, I mean, it's a personal value in my own work as an artist and also as a curator. Um, is that it's okay to ask your audience to do and think about and sit with difficult things. Um, it is also okay for your audience to say no. Um, and as an artist, um, it is, uh, and also as a human being, it is um, good and best, best practices to acknowledge um, and respect the agency. Um, and um, the and the decision of the audience and how they choose to engage. Um, but as the artist, you have the opportunity to provide. You have the opportunity to provide an opportunity. Um, and that yeah, and that's that's something that sticks with me. Um, that it's okay to ask someone to do something difficult, and it's okay for them to say no. And, and the people who need to do the work are gonna be the people who say yes um, at that time. Um, or it'll start, a, it'll start, it'll be the little seed planted that might germinate sometime later down the road when you're not around. Um, okay, final thing, finish the sentence with, with punctuation, finish the sentence. During times of trouble, art is, blank peace breath
It's so hard to just choose one word. <laughs> it also can be a, it can be a, a, a thought too. It doesn't have to be just one word. Oh, I wanted to keep it simple. Otherwise I would start crying or stumbling or something. Hey, art is just what I needed. <laughs> I, I said this because, you know, it's it's not quantifiable. It just exists. Well, I wanted to give a special thank you, Kelly, Shyla, and Sam, for talking um, and having this conversation and for your work, um, both at large and in this exhibit. Um, uh, the rest of our time is for questions. If you have questions for anyone in our panel, you can put them in the chat or if you're able to, I'm not entirely sure how I set that up, but if you want, you can unmute and ask it um, with your own voice. Um, if anybody's got any questions. Well, anybody's considering it, I just want to say thank you, Tim, for making space for all of us and for our art and for inviting us here to talk about it. It was wonderful to chat with all of you. My pleasure. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to miss the times when I can just sit in my pajama bottoms and a nice shirt <laughs> <laughs> and do a public, a public presentation. I mean, that's been one of the silver linings of all of this, right? Um, so it's business in the front party in the back. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Um, I agree. Thank you for having me on to talk about this because, you know, it's not often that you get freelance ability to just talk to your community. So for me, I was genuinely surprised and actually elated to be able to have this discussion with you. And also having this discussion with you guys has made me feel better about the fact that after this call goes, I will go back to being in my 800 square foot apartment and I will proceed to Rapunzel it the rest of the time. Um, uh, but, you know, it means a lot. These conversations mean something. Yeah. Um, I don't see any questions or comments in the chat and it doesn't seem that anybody else um, joining us has anything. So, Speak now or forever hold your peace. Can we get some? Uh... <laughs> um, uh, if you would actually, um, speakers, if you if you have not done so, if you wouldn't mind in the chat, just putting uh, maybe an email address, or if people do have questions, they can reach you later and ask you if they don't feel comfortable. Um, my email is in the chat at the beginning. Um, Shyla's, I know yours is in there as well. I just added my Instagram and my website, which has a place to contact me if you want to do that. It'll take me just a minute. I am dyslexic. <laughs> take as much time as you need. Uh, we watch it. Try to find all the letters. And I wanted to offer um, to the artists and to anybody who's on this call, if you're interested in coming to see the works that are part of this exhibit and at Memorial Hospital, we're not able to be wide open to the public for visitors just to come in on their own. But if you contact me, I can schedule a time before the show ends for you to come by and, and give you a private tour. Happy to do that anytime. I love that. I'm really glad that there are pieces hanging in the hospital and yeah, people love it. People there. love it. And yeah. if anybody is interested in doing an exhibit, um, I have miles of walls. And she means it to take her up on that <laughs> suggestion. Everybody in the chat and everybody who is joining in, just get in touch with Shyla. Yeah, it's um, it's a great. I think partnership between community artists and uh, and you know whoever is in the hospital. We have thousands of people in and out of here, twenty four seven, um, and it means a lot. It really means a lot. I have nurses and doctors and people all over the place, visitors that tell me how much they appreciate the exhibit. So it makes makes a big difference. 
And literally <laughs> miles of wall space. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm always hanging more of the the hanging system in different areas, new areas to try to expand where the possibilities are for visiting exhibits. It's been really great. And I think it's also, it, you know, I think a thank you has to go out. Um, you know, I know that nurses and doctors have already before this period saved my life. And um, the care and the ability to do it are absolutely amazing. And the, and understanding the kind of burnout that they go through and the kind of um, struggle that it is to not take that home. Um, just uh, kudos to you. Uh, it's, I imagine one of the hardest things so thanks. I, I wish there was something more, uh, you know, thank you seems hollow in, in, in retrospect, but. No, it means something. And I appreciate you saying that. And I hope that this uh, recording will get into the eyes and ears of, of uh, people who are working in healthcare and seeing the care and um, thoughtfulness and creativity that's gone into this exhibit for the sake of, of mirroring the experiences of people um, all over the city and not just about the pandemic. I think it's really important that we understand that this exhibit is equal parts about uh, what's going on in terms of social justice and racial justice particularly. Yes. And I'm, I'm thrilled that we had submissions that spoke to that because I personally felt like that was as much of what we were dealing with socially over the last two years. Yeah. It's been a way. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I'm happy to see that there was multiple discussions happening within it as well. Um, you know, it, that's the cool thing about something that brings in multiple artists is you have a lot of different perspectives in one setting. And so it becomes a fuller picture. Yeah, thank you, Tim, and for and Shia for putting this together, putting your brains together, doing the work, and bringing all of us together. Kudos to y'all too. Happy Ooh. to. We have a question. Oh, we do. Where? Yeah. <laughs> um. It's yeah. Not... No. Thank. You. For real. <laughs> Where's the question at? It's not showing up in uh, my. They said they wanted to ask a question. I don't know if they've asked it. Who it says said... Cam from mm -hmm. Anne? Lloyd Willett. Oh. Uh, to me. Sorry, just to me? Yes, of course. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I don't uh, read super duper well. <laughs> um, I, I can answer it in the chat if you'd like. Give me one second. Oh, uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, all right, well, thank you all again. Um, how are we doing a pandemic retrospective? We'll be on view at AVA through February 25th. So there's still a couple more weeks to see it. Um, after such time, uh, March 4th, Off the Walls, an exhibit of 3D and sculptural works will be uh, opening here. Um, the deadline to um, submit for those of you who are interested is next Wednesday. February the 16th. Um, oh, and, and yes, there is a question. And yes. And if you want to ask it via the microphone. Too, yes. Can, so say, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, okay, yes. Great. Yes. First of all, thank you, guys. I really appreciate this on many levels. And um, I just have a question for the artist and for you, Tim, or for anyone else. Okay. Um, the themes that came up for me as, as I continue to work for as, as a movement therapist were I can't breathe and um, but she's dying alone or someone's dying alone. So it was those were two big themes, the breath and the dying alone. And, and those seem to really resonate in the art, the artist today that spoke. And I just didn't know if um, either one of you or Tim or anyone else had anything to add to that from your perspective because that seemed to resonate just hugely with me. I never stopped working through COVID and it was, it's, it's been very exhausting for me working one-on-one -on -one with individuals. But those are two themes that came um, across my, uh, you know, through my work. 
Yeah, I would say from my perspective at the hospital, that's a fair um, reflection of some of the hardest moments, particularly early on in the pandemic, because I think um, as time went on, we were able to kind of uh, allow people to come in and be with their loved one at end of life, even if it was a COVID case. Um, but early on, there was a lot of that, uh, you know, messaging about breathing and breath and the significance of that in so many different ways. I think it, it became a way for us to explore our fear. And then, um, and then I think that, that loneliness, that isolation um, and the, the dying alone, I think was definitely something that was such a strong uh, experience that I think we're gonna be processing for a long time. Yeah. And, and I'll, on, on the flip side of that, uh, the, the solitude and the loneliness, um, in the picture actually on the shared screen right now to the left uh, and your pieces are in the middle and to the far left, there's a painting by Jan Burleson and it's titled Things Pile Up. And I think the title of that piece actually is a, is a theme that I saw kind of throughout a lot of the submissions for the exhibit, um, both at Ava and at Memorial. Um, whether it's like bodies of people living together piled up in a really close space, um, you, know, you know, the, the COVID cases and, and deaths and hospitalizations, um, you know, the, the kind of the personal space things of, of lawn, like Jan, literally Jan's painting of uh, what could be interpreted as like a pile of laundry or folded clothing. Um, you know, the, the unprocessed emotions, the kind of the anger, the, the grief. I mean, even the way that we process kind of, um, I can't breathe and, and isolation and loneliness, all that also piles up um, when it isn't given space to, to be addressed. And I think that was a, a, a very consistent theme I also noticed. For me, that was one of the hardest things about the pandemic. Um, I, I have bad breathing problems and I also have a fear of being alone. Ironically, this is my personal hell. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think that was what was so striking to me about the Black Lives Movement and George, uh, George Floyd's murder. Um, when you ask for breath, you ask for life. And um, if you've never experienced going without air, it seems like it wouldn't, it is intrinsically painful. It burns. And even after you can take air again, it burns. Um, it hurts deep. And so when I heard those phrases and I heard that, it produced a fear response in me that is very close to a lot of the negative experiences that I had. And so for me, it was processing this horrible things that were happening in front of me, but it was also processing the horrible things that had happened to me. And so it was deeper than anything I could articulate. Um, those have stuck with me as well. You know, the, um, you know, it's kept me inside for, for a very long time and um i don't know how to conquer that fear yet i've tried to put it into work i've tried to talk about it i've tried to process it and i think sometimes when you experience trauma if you're still in the trauma you won't be able to fully find your way through it because you're still experiencing it and so I think we're still experiencing this shared trauma where I don't know that I even have enough space for that yet because it's such a heavy thing. Um, you know, I, I had the unfortunate thing of accidentally watching the video of his death and um, his murder. And I remember thinking, that's what I hope my last words aren't. And the discourse and the, the hospitals and the being alone and the video calls and the, it was so much. 
I guess what I would say to it is take space, take time. Don't let it overwhelm you yet because you're still in the middle of it. You're still experiencing it. And so there's no way to see it until you reach the end of it. I wish I had better advice on it, but from my experience, you can't, can't reconcile trauma while you're experiencing it. Kelly, did you have a response to the question? No, I can't really add anything to that, but I think Sam is right that part of the reason that there is so much anger and sadness is that because we are all in different points on that path of grief and trauma and trying to process. And some people are in the space on the, on the path where they think they're past it and they're ready to move on and, and start processing. And perhaps some of them are realizing that they're, they're not there yet. And um, yeah, it's hard working through something like this as a community and as an individual, um, trying to reconcile those things together is difficult. Um, and thank you for your question. Um, and also thank you for your work in the exhibit. Um, all right, if there is nothing else, um, we will sign it off. Um, and come see us at AVA. And if you want to see the work at Memorial, reach out to Shyala um, to schedule that with her. Um, and a reminder, this will be available on AVA's next newsletter. Um, so keep an eye out for that. If you have people that you knew that wanted to see this or to listen to this conversation, that will be available to share out with them. Um, all right. Thank you all. Have a good evening. And see Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks.